On air? Oh, we're good. I think we're good. I think we're on air. Okay. I think we're live already. Anyway, good morning and welcome to the machine kit, machine talk tutorial. Um, I hope that works out with a um, video stream. Uh, it's my first time ever I do this, so be, please be patient with me um, if we run into problems. Um, Machine Talk is the replacement infrastructure which I've worked on over the last three years or so, and it's now reached a stage where it's becoming usable and applications built can be built on top. And this talk is up. Uh, uh, intends to give a basic introduction to how it all fits together and it, what, what it intends to do. Um, let me switch to the slides here by doing this. This. Start screen share. Is that it? Okay, that should work. Okay, uh, we have about two hours time. I hope to do most of the stuff in the first uh, hour uh, and leave extensive time for question and answers. There will be a lot, probably also a lot of planned looks. <laughs> and uh, there are also some examples which I prepared and I hope to be able to work through them on my Mac if everything works out. So you will get a little bit more haptic feelings, uh, feeling on how all this fits together. Um, altogether, this is the, the, the underpinnings which Alex used to build the Qt Quick VCP application, and that's also already used by Glade VCP. Uh, so Alex's talk, which will be later on, will build upon this. Um, okay, uh, uh, let's be realistic what we can do here in these two hours. I've been working on this quite a long time, so it's a lot. Uh, um, what we really can do is we, we can touch upon what was so so broken on the old architecture that we had to uh, 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 we had to do something about it. Uh, I can give you an overview of what that replacement stack is going to look like. We'll focus on a few key parts. I'll leave out some, for instance, auto discovery, because that's not essential for the understanding how it works. Uh, um, we'll, I have some examples prepared, which I hope to be able to run live in the second part of the talk. Uh, and and lay the foundation for Alex's talk, which is about to follow thereafter. OK, now, first of all, the motivation of this. Um, Linux CNC works, so why actually break it, right? Uh, uh, and that's a question which I've been faced as well. Why, why are you doing this at all? Now, if you look at the, the parts here, HAL is a very versatile and uh, versatile tool, but it has exactly zero provisions for any remote operations. It's shared memory, single CPU only. Uh, so there is nothing built in the API or any abstraction which can be built upon. So it's kind of, well, you can do it, but it's very inelegant and repetitive. On the other hand, the original EMC architecture as it fell out of NIST was actually fully distributed, at least by intent. And um, that sort of rot away of, over the years, uh, piecemeal, by, um, well, I think not really paying attention to it. Um, <clears throat> it just works on a single PC just fine, so let's cut that corner. And piecemeal, it turned the original distributed architecture turned into a single PC application, vertical stack down. So uh, there are really two pieces in there, the hell, uh, with hell, hell, which doesn't really support any report or remote operation. NML, which should, um, but it was a one-off effort back then, more than well, almost 20 years, I think. Uh, it was our first uh, middleware stack, as, as seen by the NIST guys. So time has moved on. Um, I was asked on the list a couple of months ago by Andy Pogba, 
well, what's so broken about NML uh, uh, that you think you have to do something about it? Um, I can't go through this all here. If you click on that link, it will f it, it, it bring you to the email thread where we discussed this. Um, I'll just go through the key points in the next slide, but the verdict is uh, it's beyond repair. We, we have to take it out. Uh, that NML RCS stack has to go, and in particular the status sharing structure, EMC status, which has turned into a monstrosity, also has to go. Uh, so what, what I'm up to here is not a grandiose new architecture. It's a hopefully once per decade repair job. Uh, we, I hope to keep the car, the car color, the steering wheel is in the same place, but the engine, powertrain, wheels, that's all going to be different. Hope you'll be able to drive with it just the same, but uh, to get you that idea. Um, so the overall idea is we build a replacement stack in parallel and then take over the applications piecemeal. So just to play devil's advocate here for people that might be thinking this question in their mind, why do we need to be distributed? Why can't we go with everything on a single PC? Uh, that's a very good question. Why, 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 why go distributed at all if it works on a single PC? Well, first, uh, having everything from graphics on, on the, to a real-time control of pins and peripherals on, on a single platform brings its own sets of problems, uh, like driver incompatibilities, hardware which doesn't like to cooperate. Um, the PC, as we know it, is heading for extinction, so that needs revisiting eventually, too. So um, the, the, the vision really is you, you, you take out the real-time part and make it an outboard function, really a headless computer sitting in a, in a box somewhere, and you just drive it over an Ethernet connection, but you don't fiddle with the graphics and all the problems it, it brings. Uh, and that will, uh, it is a huge step to make the remote capable, but once you have it, uh, you take out a lot of stuff which now runs very close to the real-time kernel, like interpreter, the task, the UI, uh, add-on components. That can be all moved away to platforms which might be better suited. So at the end, this will give us a split of functionality. We'll have a, a specialized real-time box or a card or uh, <laughs> which just does that. And then we have the UI functions and, and the interpreter, what, what have you, in this, in this game, instead of going somewhere else, maybe on platforms which are more suitable. And that is the thinking behind enabling uh, new user interface technologies. It's a prerequisite to make that split before we can tack on, say, Android or something, uh, tablets as a user interface. So it's kind of a pre precondition. Um, but still, it's, it's not a grandiose new thing. It's a repair job. Uh, you don't want to... I'm not going to read you through this. This is just the excerpt of what I found. Uh, I had to answer Andy on this question, why are you breaking? And it's a whole lot. But <laughs> um, um, ju just to pick out a, a, key, uh, a few key ones, um, for instance, any message, you don't want to read this. <laughs> Just take it. It's a lot of characters, right? Um, for instance, all the, the message descriptions are static in size. It's pretty much like a C structure, meaning you can't, cannot have optional fields like or repeated fields, variable length fields. That's always not supported. Uh, if you want to tag that stack into any language like uh, Python, Perl, uh, what have you, there's no automatic way to tech into that, like a bindings generator, uh, meaning uh, the bindings are utterly incomplete, which we have now. It's just a very small subset, which is actually available to Python. Uh, the rest of it is ju just hidden in a, in a big pile of C code. Uh, <coughs> there are various fundamental limitations, like uh, you can send a message from A to B, but B doesn't know who A was. You cannot tell the originator. Very, very fun, fundamental stuff, which is, oh, why is this? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to go through this in detail. That has been discussed uh, at length. 
language pen findings is just one of them. So, but uh, since very few of you probably have actually programmed at the NML level, lucky you, uh, <laughs> let's just have a look at what we're actually leaving behind, what the main concept is there. And if you look at it closely, it turns out it's really simple. What the whole thing is about is what is essentially a name shared memory region. The names are what they call buffers, like the command, the status, and the error buffers, or channels. Um, you can operate on these memory buffers by uh, reading them. You have support for an atomic write, and you can peek into it. But it's basically like a non-destructive read operation. But it's just this blob of memory, and all of this overlaid is basically a C structure, which is the, the current NML message. So it is a really, really simple interaction model which you have there. Um, the message structures are defined in C++, uh, but the way they're used, they're really just plain, plain old data, C, C structures. And that's where many of these restrictions come from. Now, that, that's quite a trivial interaction model if you look at it, but it comes at a cost. There's a, a at least uh, 36,000 lines of C++ code, which are essentially unmaintained because nobody else uses them. And that's an issue in carrying it forward. There are very few people who still are uh, intimately know it or are actually willing to get their hands oily and working on it, uh, provided that made sense. So what we're leaving behind is actually quite, quite simple communications interaction pattern. Now, uh, let, let me turn to, to my edition where I want to, want to take this. This is a portable distributed toolkit to build pretty much arbitrary motion applications, CNC being one of them. Uh, but uh, I really want to enable others, meaning we, we need to get out of this mindset, a single application stack, and this is it. So that means we need to have, introduce APIs, there will be a lot of APIs which we'll be talking in the next one and a half hours. And we need to do something about the UI technology. This is rotting away as we speak. I mean, TK pretty much hasn't seen a patch in a decade. GTK2, the, the Glade editor, is already falling out of support at the Debian uh, uh, Wheezy level. So uh, it's. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure every, all, all people share the sense of urgency here, but uh, I think a, a makeover is overdue. Uh, also to enable more recent technologies. For instance, the binding to GTK and TK essentially meant this is a desktop only stand. Yeah? Uh, the, the GTK has no credible pass forward into embedded or, the, or mobile, uh, which would be interesting as a replacement UI downstream. So there's, no, there's not much hope on that pass. So we'll split it in two. It's, I hope it's going to involve as a more general toolkit, but it will definitely retain that CNC application on top, but we'll migrate that to the new stack. Okay. Now, that's not something which has come out of thin air. Uh, the, we three, uh, John, uh, Charles, and me, already worked in the past on porting this, this stuff to, to new real-time kernels, which was called the universal binary or universal build. So we covered the portable real-time part. This runs on any real-time kernel inside with a single build, uh, a fully automatic environment detection. So that's covered. That's the lowest level, layer, if you will. And now we're eating the next layer up in the stack, and that's the communications infrastructure. So uh, UBC covered the real-time part, and now Machine Talk covers the layer above it, will make it portable and distributed, it, and enable it to hook arbitrary UI technologies into it. Uh, and if not even necessarily bound to a particular operating system, the, what we are actually sharing between externally are, isn't even a code API, it's a message definition API. Uh, what Alex and myself shared in the development of Qt Quick VCB was not the Linux CNC source tree, it was the repository with the message definitions. Yeah? So it's actually a very abstract API. 
uh, not tied to a particular library and how you transport these things. And it's going to be actually separate. Uh, it turns out that uh, that protopath definition library, the message definition library, is also a very convenient licensing boundary. So if you'd want to tack on a, a, a proprietary API, uh, a proprietary UI, that will be possible. And you're still being firewalled off the GPL code in machine talk from that messaging layer. Yes, that was overdue. OK. Uh, now, that's my private, uh, my personal vision, but I feel that if people sort of think this is a sensible route to go. Now, from that, we, we arrive on uh, a set of requirements. Uh, that's a long list. The top level links you, the, the, the title links you to, a, to the actual requirements document. So it really didn't start as a weekend hack, but we're, we thought about it for a while. Um, what is actually done? So the first one, obviously, was we need wider language support. And uh, that's just the minimum list here. But uh, in particular, if any, any support comes automatic in the sense that either it's automatically derived from by, by a tool chain, or uh, one can import third party projects to use those bindings, that would be extra welcome. That, for instance, would get rid of the fact that NML has essentially very incomplete bindings on only to Python and TCL. And that's it. Um, another uh, aspect was um, the fitness for RT. Now, if you look at NML, that's all written in C++. Um, uh, and the, the support library is all, also C++. That means you cannot operate uh, C++ in a real-time environment, be it kernel or user land threads. Uh, first, there's no, no support to run C++ libraries in the, in the Linux kernel per se. But it's even an issue with the user land thread flavors with Xenomire or RT preamp, because C++ re heavily relies on dynamic memory allocation. And that's clearly a showstopper in a, in a, in when you're doing real-time coding. Uh, <coughs> Now, that media break in the NML architecture uh, led to a practice, what I call translators, or transcoding at the boundary. The whole user interface, task, interpreter part, talks NML. And once it, the, a, a command emanating out from, say, the interpreter hits the real-time part, it's got to be translated into a C structure, field by field. That's a very tedious process. And by the way, it's error prone. So uh, no proxies, no translations, uh, no transcoding. It's got to be end to end. If you, that's my vision is, you define a JSON object in a in a browser, send it through a WebSocket connection, and it hits the RT uh, a, a RT component which understands it, unmutilated and without any proxy in between, which does super clever translation because oh my, oh my God, we can't use NML here. That, uh, that, that has to go. It is, uh, it is just the outcome of a, of a, of a design principle, which, I, which is under my you know, holy grail. It is the, the, sorry, you have a question. Well, what's an example of, of a translator? Which you a translator, translator very simple, very, in the current code, very is simple example, uh, very close. Uh, a very simple example for such a translator is, um, at the boundary between task and the motion component. Um, if you send, say, if you, let's assume you hit escape on a keyboard. Now, that gives rise to what's called an, an EMC abort NML mm -hmm. message. And that uh, gets scheduled so, through task. And then it has to be passed down to motion uh, to stop the, uh, the trajectory plan that in its track and uh, just play that. Yeah. Uh, and at that very boundary, it is being translated at, in task in the interface layer to, to motion into a, into a C structure. And it's done on a message per message basis. And it's super ugly code, by the way. You don't want to go there. So that's, that, that is actually the, the most inflexible part of all the, all the APIs we have there. You, you add any, any 
any message type, you you don't just have to fix the using code. You have to fix the translators as well. So those have to go. So the one principle which is has to be followed at all costs is the end-to-end -end principle. If you're interested, you read it. It's a seminal paper by Jared Saltzer from, I think, 72 or so. It's called The End-to-End -end Argument in Systems Design. And it, it, it laid out a lot of the thinking behind the internet architecture. A very strong paper, The End-to-End -end Argument in Systems Design. And that, that I'm following here verbatim. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not better, just copy them. <laughs> so that's my, that's my, my strategy. OK, uh, <clears throat> so that's the translator thing, end to end. Uh, no arbitrary limitations, uh, meaning like message size. I'm sorry. Uh, like having a defined number of tool entries because the, the, the message doesn't support a flexible format. Well, uh, that's pretty poor. We want to have uh, arbitrary optional fields and repeated fields, and with no pre-compiled repeat count. Uh, we might compromise on that on the real-time boundary, because unlimited repeat counts usually translate into dynamic memory allocation. Uh, so you might send a, set a maximum there. Once we come to the protobuf definition, we see how that's handled. But on principle, uh, you know, what we want to take out this, this, uh, C, basically this, this basically a limitation which comes from the C language. Uh, and NML is just a glorified C structure being transported through shared memory and a bit of TCP. Uh, it's going to be architecture independent. So if we have a big Indian on one end and a little Indian on the other, uh, we don't want to deal with architecture incompatibilities here, different floating point formats, what have you. That, that has to be taken care of of the middleware layer. And it is typically called, that job is called serialization and deserialization, translating an internal format into a portable wire format and back. Yeah? So that needs to be taken care of. NML does, but at a cost. You have to serialize every single field manually. Uh, that's why it's so unpopular to add any of those, right? Um, now, the next one is actually a tough one. So far, the, uh, if you look at HAL applications, that is, there's a lot of polling going on. If, for instance, monitor, uh, UI monitors a bit in a HAL uh, bit pin for a status change, like a switch, yeah, and to reflect it in a LED widget, if you want. Yeah. What it does, it constantly pulls the HAL pin for a status change at a rate of typically 100 milliseconds or so, which is below where it's being sensitive from a responsiveness point of view from, from UI. Now, there's, so there's a lot of polling going on here. That is sort of fine as long as you're on a single machine. If you extend the polling paradigm to work over remote messaging, over a networking stack, you incur a lot of delays. Okay, so that polling model doesn't really scale uh, or to a, net, to a networked uh, connection, and uh, you will see later on how that's being dealt with. So that polling model has to go partially, uh, and. Uh, uh, what that means, for that, what I meant by this blocking messaging support is, right now, these uh, all these UIs which we use. Uh, I'm sorry, from the UK. Sorry. All all these UIs which we use, they poll, but they have no way to wait for a particular change. Uh, they, they they do this with inspecting values and and calling a timer. Now, uh, uh, remotely, what you want to do is just wait for an event and uh, uh, be notified. But you don't want a busy loop like you do with polling. So that has to go. Uh, um, if you're just starting a single stack, uh, um, 
Too wide and high on a 4.3 screen. Oh, how are we going to deal with it? Yeah, we'll try to fix that. Yeah. <coughs> uh, you see? Right here. Where we were. Startup and shutdown. Now, if you, you just start Linux CNC on a single PC. Um, oh, sorry. No, I, I, I'm. Okay. No, I'm messing this up. I'm sorry, Michael. <laughs> We're fine, we're back. Uh, <clears throat> if you just run this on a single PC, you can define the startup order of all components, and uh, it's fine. If you have remote uh, entities uh, involved, like a UI, which might be turned off and on at random, you've got to take care of startup ordering and sequencing. Uh, if I turn on that, that tablet and have it connect to that stack, I cannot re just restart the stack at this point just to take care of startup sequencing. That doesn't work. So it has to be able to connect and disconnect in any order. Real-time stack comes up, UI comes up, and they need to find each other, but no matter what the relative timing of those are. Okay? So that's it. That's a requirement which actually eases the use and, uh, and configuration quite a bit because you get out of certain straitjackets. But those who have ever dealt with the, what's, what's called the post GUI hell file, that's one of those straitjackets. Yeah. Uh, the other one, is, and another one is what I call idempotent connect and reconnect. Now, if parties connect uh, and they understand each other fine, but uh, what happens if the cable breaks? Yeah? Well, eventually they'll find each other, but the result after a break and a reconnection should be the same one as before. And you'll see later when we touch on from Siri and Q that it very nicely supports that property. There's essentially nothing to do. We just imported it with the Siri and Q stack. It's, it's very handy to use. Um, some messaging stacks. Uh, uh, requires on what's called brokers. Those are, let's call it, administrative demons, which mediate between the parties. Uh, that really translates into a management job. We, we don't want any of those. It's going to be not, no hands-free hands -free operation, no, no, uh, no extra demons to configure and all that. Uh, the, the messaging the structure should be based on an interface description language. The reason why, well, you could write all this in C, but it's not a very good dis description language for messages because it doesn't support optional or repeated fields. So uh, that's what uh, uh, this, that's a relation, serialization layer Protobuf gives us. And it also gives us the ability to compile that description the abstract message description in anything of, some, I think, about 40 different language findings for Protobuf. So it's pretty absurd. We're just using three of them. Uh, but it's very extensive. <coughs> just keep trying. Mm -hmm. uh, um, what is uh, probably a new in the context of what we are doing here is what I'm writing here with introspection support. Uh, what, what this introspection means is you can get a blob of a message and figure out at runtime what it was. Yeah? NML has not a whole lot of that. In particular, no support for optional or repeated or any of that. Uh, uh, Protobuf is very strong at that point because the whole message description, the definition of the language, is compiled into descriptors which are available at runtime. So you can say, oh, by the way, parse that back into a text representation for me, and it almost looks like you wrote it in the, in the definition. We'll see that in, a, in an example later on. It is also the basis for the automatic translation between JSON and protobuf formats. Uh, we can easily add on a web, web, web sockets channel at the, output, at, the, at the boundary of this application, and it's automatic, and it's due to protobuf supporting introspection. The, the term used in a protobuf uh, 
repositories, the reflection interface. That's where you can introspect into messages and determine the fields and field types and names and uh, what they mean. Uh, we, now, if we go distributed, there are several, probably several entities, and you've got to plumb those together. Now, how do you plumb things together? Well, with a URI, really, right? Uh, that is basically a tuple protocol uh, serving entity, uh, maybe a, a, the IP address of a, of a target or a domain name, a port number there, which might be derived from the service, and a, a, a closer identification of the resource within the target, which is the URI which you're passing, which you're using on the web all the time. That's the standard method. Now, if we have lots of these entities, we have lots of URIs. And if you run such a thing in a, in a setup, say, with DHCP, with dynamic IP addresses, you've got a lot of moving targets when it comes to URIs. So uh, if you want to plumb them together, uh, and reverting to static IP addresses is very unattractive. So uh, to, to get around that, we added a layer called, um, that was a quite late addition based on, on ZeroConf, or multicast DNS, that has turned out really well. It's not fully finished yet, and I'm not going to talk about, about it a lot here. But it's in place that it will be used. It's functionally not relevant. It's just for finding so the endpoints find each other. And they know that they, they belong to a single instance of a, a real-time application. And we use zero comp for that. Yeah. That's the auto discovery part. And it's going to be web friendly in the sense that uh, we, we, I always wanted to have a, a WebSockets JSON outlet of the whole thing which works just as well to enable web-based user interfaces to hell and eventually the, also to the Linux CNC application. Sorry if that's, that's probably a lot of requirements but, and quite complex, so. Yeah, any questions cover, about this? You're gonna cover how much this is actually implemented versus. Yes, yeah. yes, most of it is. I'm sure you have a good question. Uh, the question was whether um, I would touch upon how much of this is implemented. Yes, I will. <laughs> Pretty much complete. I hope not too and complete. Including the, the JSON, do you know the, the JSON web sockets? You're that not is on that's using the other interfaces to provide those. Yes, well, there is a there's a can demo where you can see it. It's in place. It's not that's not web web over anymore. Uh, what it, this is machine talk reprint represents an intermediate release in a sense that the remultification of hell is done, but the rest of NML as used in Linux CNC per se to talk to the interpreter, to talk to task, to, to talk to IO control, that is not done yet. Okay? So we're, we're, we're currently at the hell level. However, the infrastructure is already there. The hard part was getting that integrated into the build, to have the support libraries in place, to have uh, unified build support, and it's relatively e much more easier now to glue, glue on additional uh, uh, entities there, which uh, and take out an NML piecemeal out of the rest. Now I'm going to cover this. So now from that, uh, we have a couple of overall concerns which I have to address. I hope that's not too small, uh, but I talked about the, the service discovery. I'm just mentioning it once. We'll drop it for the rest of the talk. Um, for web UIs, I already mentioned we'll use WebSockets and, and uh, JSON.io because that's the lingua franca there. Now, about how to encode a message, we talked about that NML is uh, very, very severely limited here. We'll use the Google Protobuf message description library for that. Um, and uh, it will come as a fresh air once you get the, the basic principles behind it. It's very easy. Uh, uh, just, just let me say, behind the picking these components was also a very close look at outsourcing support. 
I only picked components here which have massive user uh, communities and which do not require our handholding, other than NML, for instance, which is essentially unmaintained. Uh, yeah, no, it's. Uh, I can't do anything right now about it. No, no, no. If you make it bigger, then for whatever reason, it's shifted down to the right on the YouTube um, screencast. And so this is uh, you know, small, but they can actually read it. Okay. Whereas, can you read it? I mean, I can't read it on the phone, really. But I don't know. Your message I got was yes, about 50% of what you type it all there. Thanks. Okay. How about we remove the full screen and then just move toward that one? Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to try, but I couldn't get it. Somebody will have to tell me if this works. Please stand by. It's not working on this. I wonder if. Ah! Come on. Of course, I don't know how long it's going to take. Really. Yeah. Boy, it doesn't seem to want to do anything in between. Yeah. Oh, that was kind of good. But then it switched. Do I have to look 45 there, seconds there. ago? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's good. good. That's good. Oh, that's that's excellent. excellent. Yeah, that's there. Good. That's good. Yeah. I'm not touching anything. I'm not touching anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh! oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the control so loop, loop is a little uh, yeah. slow here. That would have been good. Yeah. Of course, we're ages ago. It looks good. We got there. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's relatively good. We don't want to touch it yet. I think John is right. Yeah, I think John is right. I think this is where we're on. And if I just do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. fine. Yeah. fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry okay. That, everybody. We're maneuvering parameter land here. So. Yeah. So, for, for the concern, how do we encode the messages? We'll use Protobuf. We'll have a couple of examples uh, later in the second part of the talk. For the how do we get from A to B? That is currently built in TCP sockets or shared memory operations in NML. We also use an external replacement part. Uh, if anybody is really interested in, in building uh, distributed systems, uh, I really suggest they look into Serum Q. It's a, 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 a tool with a very long heat lever. Um, and it also supports a lot of language findings, which we're already using. Um, now, you'll find there the term uh, uh, real-time scalar I.O. Scalars are really single objects like pins or signals. Uh, that always was supported, in a sense, in, uh, in, uh, in HAL, uh, uh, at the pin level and signal level. And, um, for efficiency reasons and for abstraction reasons, these are grouped into what I call services. I'll come to them later on. So how, uh, how, how is that dealt with in a remote scenario? Uh, talking commands to a real-time component is a little bit different from talking at the single pin level. For instance, what you do with motion is you send it a command to cut a line from A to B, and A and B are nine vectors. So that's a lot of state which has to go in one, in one step, in one commit. Uh, and at that point, hell with these single scalars uh, is not suitable anymore as a transmission medium. So that's where we reverse to queued operation uh, and, and ring buffers. Um, and I'll expand a little bit about those. Uh, giving examples where they are integrated into Python already. Um, so that messaging is supported by the ring buffer API. I hope to introduce a vehicle which makes the plumbing of components uh, which deal with messages similar, simple, like it's built health components at the pin level. 
that is still experimental, but it's not necessary, uh, not, not required to do HAL applications. That's called the message bus daemon. I'll leave it out for the rest of the talk with this because it's not required for HAL. Uh, you might find some uh, items being in italic. Those still need work. What we still have to do in this is to address the question of configuration in a distributed setup. Linux CNC uses this great tool of an ini file, which was invented by the company which brought us, brought us seminal computer science innovations like edlin.com and command.com, and it does show. So <laughs> it's not, it's not, it is uh, it is uh, the running gag of user friendly. Yes, you can do something, but that's about all of it. Uh, and then probably the the, the the, the ini file concept breaks in a distributed scenario. You can't just shuffle around ini files yeah? and, and glue these things together at that level. So configuration will become a network service just alike, and it's going to be kept in a single place. And that place, by the way, way by the way, will be held. It will get a little bit the smell of the Windows registry. Please don't throw eggs at me now. So. <laughs> We only keep the good parts, namely a tree structured organization and, uh, and an automatic update service. So, the configuration has to be distributed as well. Uh, right now, that's not done. It's discussed in an extensive track and thread on how it will be done, um, but it's not there. So, for the time being, we'll have to link along with any files. Yeah. But at some point, those will. See end of life as well. Okay, so that's roughly the the range of topics. That's quite from quite low level, real time, like sending messages to a real time component and getting it back from them, to rather high level stuff like JSON. So we have quite a bandwidth uh, of topic. One thing I touched upon in the uh, in the last slide was what I call the service that will be taken off by the hell Arcom and by the hell group service. Now, what that is, it, well, it addresses one of these concerns. For instance, uh, reporting and setting hell objects, observing a pin, observing a signal, uh, or another concern could be sending commands to the motion control and say, move here, draw a line here, cut along here, abort the motion. Or an, still another one is tap into a logging stream. Yeah? Uh, Long-time Linux NC users know there's uh, a, a very odd feature. Log messages are going to the first user. The others don't see it. Yeah? It's, it's a, there's no way in multiple uh, UIs can consume a log message. It's pretty odd. That's very easily replaced by a published subscribe pattern in Serum Q. We'll come to that in the second part. Uh, so that's. That's typically one of as a service addresses one of these concerns, yeah? and they're all made such that there can be an arbitrary number of using entities, yeah? not just one, but many subscribers to this. The service is identified by a URI, and that doesn't look all that different from what you are used to as a URI. It's TCP colon slash slash IP address colon port number. What goes with it is uh, an interaction pattern. How do the endpoints communicate? And what type of messages are transferred? So that's really the unit of a, a, a that's what it's described as a service. And we have now in operation about three of them, which are critical, and there are some supporting services. The three one which we'll actually use in the, in the demo with the tablet there. Are the remote component support and HAL commands like setting pins or interacting with pins and signals uh, from a remote entity? So that's are two of these, these services. The HAL group service we don't use in the demo. Uh, many of these services are associated with a name, and that's the uh, they have a name, and that's used at the at the zero conf level. For instance, hell command, hell r command, and hell uh, r com are visible in the domain name service as service types like HTTP. 
And so that's reflected up into the DNS, really. Uh, and services are also the place where authentication and credentials will happen. That's italic. That means it's not done yet. Okay. Uh, not, not, okay. That's going to be a, a little bit loaded. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, it's probably a little bit too dense to go through all of them. But uh, I will touch upon uh, three or four key parts in there. I'm sorry, it's very hard visible. Uh, I can't enlarge those. Uh, what we will address, the, the, the dash dotted box in the, in the right center, is the, is the real-time part. That's where all the health components live. And where we talked about, there's a wrong, only a rather hackish uh, uh, or ad hoc interface to send commands and get responses from. At that boundary, we'll introduce that ring buffer API. Okay? Um, on top of that real-time part, there's one serving process, and we'll stumble about that a couple more times. It's called HellTalk. And it's a dual-phase thing. On the one side, it talks to Hell through its C API. Uh, on, on the other hand, on the other side, it can be connected to through CRMQ uh, connections, CRMQ sockets, and it talks growth above. So that's where the translation happens between these worlds. And that's what makes Hell remote capable at the pin and signal and component level. It's that process, that Hell talk process on top. Uh, I'll skip most of the parts, the ones I'll address are to the left. We have basically two interfaces to the whole thing, one being based on protobuf and serum Q, and a semantically one-to-one -one equivalent being based on JSON and protobuf, on JSON and web sockets. Those are exchangeable. You can actually build applications which use part serum Q protobuf and use part JSON and web sockets, and in the using layer, you don't see any difference of them. I'm sorry, that, but this is a slide which I probably should have left out or cut down substantially. Uh, so, Mike, can I ask a question about that last Sure. Slide? Yeah. Can you elaborate on the difference between HellTalk and MessageBus? Uh, HellTalk does work only on scalars like pins and signals. Uh, and that's done and works, and it's the basis for the remote yard. The message bus will address the other concern, namely getting message messages in and out of real-time components, command messages, whole aggregates, draw, uh, cut a line, cut a, cut a circle, a board. Yeah? And LDOC only does scales, pins, pins, and, and signals, and components. Including error messages coming back. Uh, in the, the error message is another service. <laughs> okay. Which you can subscribe to and get all those. Yes. Uh, but yes, in many cases, the error messages are packed on onto the protobuf messages which go off from Helto. If you do oh. a mistake, that travels piggybacked onto, onto the reply message. It's actually the hell error message from the hell library there. So if, if, if I implemented an interface through using the C, C, Python bindings that you have for yeah. robots, yeah. Um, is, is that all I need to get to everything, or do I need to actually implement other things more to come uh, to the real time? The plan is to be complete. Sir? No, 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 repeat the question. Say again. Can you repeat it? Do you understand the question? No, it was about, can, can you get away with Python to pro it as an interface to all no, that? No, no, I was, I was trying to ask, if, 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 if I implement the, what you're showing here is with like this protobuf zero and few socket connection for user land using the C++ yeah. API, Yes. Uh, does that give me everything I need to talk to yes, it in does. real time? So if you want to make sure that you repeat that into yeah. the microphone. The question was, uh, do the components as they exist with, a, with, a, with their APIs, are these already sufficient to uh, do an end-to-end -end interaction from, say, a web UI to real time and back? Or do you need to program anything? Well, yeah, because you also mentioned things like the HALBUS and some other 
communication mechanisms to talk to the real time. Is this the only thing I would need to implement to talk to the real time? To completely replace everything with the real time? Uh, so then, you put it all my translation. Well, the question. global real time, yes. Uh, there's also like the motion and trajectory planner that you're probably implying you would like to talk to. And, and those are not necessarily. That's not, not yet. Okay. No. And that's where message bus comes into play. Yes. Yeah, that's where you have a message like, you know, follow this busy curve or, or right. draw, uh, you know, do an arc at this speed. So your user yeah. interface might do something as simple as toggle 1013 on the parallel port. And that would go through how talk. Yes, exactly. Or your UI may do something as complex as interpret the following line of G code and cause the machine to move. And that would go through message bus. Yes. It is a message bus will be an adapter on top of that ring buffer API and act as a, in a similar role like HellTalk, uh, but not operating on Hell scalers, pins and signals, but on, on, on messages going in and out from real time. And it, ma it makes it easy to plug into these things. Uh, if you don't, the alternative is use the C or Python API at that level. And uh, that essentially takes care of, of it, it, it brings it a layer higher, if you want. So right now, you can say, move a motor at a given velocity, you just said that. But you can't say, do a coordinated accelerated move with these three motors in coordination. That's sort of the next layer up. That's sort of, uh, you know, part of that's real time, part of that's not real time. That's still based on NML, and we're working on switching it over to it. Um, the new messaging stuff that will uh, be much easier to use. So once that's done, it would be very easy to make a web interface to do Maybe. everything for machine control, but we're, we're not there yet. Um, we'll have an example part, uh, one application which shows how to send a command from, uh, from a web socket, encoded as a JSON object, through the existing pro proxy all the way to the real-time component, make the real-time component answer, and go back to the web UI. Okay? That's all in place. That needed, the, the only programming I needed is maybe 150 or 100 lines of Python code, because that message bus part, part isn't in place yet. I'm, I'm just trying to figure out. I, I want to take a web application and uh, take from their yeah. G code and dump it to you know, whatever components are interpreting and executing G code. And get feedback about when when the commands uh, execute if there's errors in a couple months. Yeah. Okay. Wait a couple months, then come back to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The the, the G code that uh, uh, for instance is not not something handled at the hell layer. It's on the application layer above. That's what I said when I, when I hope I was uh, I'm sorry if I was unclear. We're addressing here only hell layer for now. Uh, I'm working on getting the rest into this as well, but we're not there yet. So there are ways to do that with the CNC, but not really. yeah. And I shouldn't bother trying them until this is done. Not yet. If you need it, you can. I don't need it urgently. I just want to do it. Yes. Yeah, you, you, you want to use the new thing. Okay. <laughs> okay, I hope that's covered. Now, uh, now we're reworking the car, so let's look at the set of spares and go through these in turn. Uh, so that's power train, uh, new tires, and the engine. Uh, the whole thing, thing uh, what comes with this uh, branch is, is a set of HAL API extensions. So there are a couple of new HAL objects, which you're, you're, you're not familiar with yet. Uh, we'll talk about this in turn. Uh, and we go through the network plumbing on top of it. Yeah? We'll skip the discovery part. But for all of these uh, uh, examples, which sort of convey the idea, and they're all in Python, except for the real-time component, they're all Python bindings in place. So, uh, I completely redid those, per, uh, separate from the existing HAL bindings, uh, and that's much more extensive than what's, what's currently available. So a bunch of HAL extensions. Uh, the the protobuf library, which we pretty much imported as is, and the CRMQ transport. 
Now let's go through these in turn. Uh, that's a quite a fundamental object, uh, uh, and so I'm, I'll expand a bit on that. Um, a ring buff is essentially what's called a FIFO or a Q. Um, other than uh, Qs which you find at the operating system level, uh, those don't want support waiting for anything. Those are non-blocking queues. Right? We don't do that uh, because they're intended to work between real-time components and between real-time and user land components. So they don't require any operating support or any operating system support. They're just shared memory structures and they are single-ended, single reader, single writer. Yeah? Uh, and that, uh, that's because it turns out that's entirely complete as a usage scenario. There's a single one where it doesn't, and that's the error message queue, because multiple components can create error messages. That's handled within new text. It's very simple. Uh, so it, it wouldn't be, have been necessary to support multiple readers and writers. The whole thing is a C API, and it's, in, it's, in a, in, it's a header only thing. It's just a couple of static inlines. Um, as I said, non blocking, and other than much of the stuff which is now in Linux, it's, it's multi craft safe. Um, Charles uh, kindly uh, helped to review that code that it actually is. So. Uh, much of that work was actually done by Pavel Shamov, our senior res advisor in residence of complex code, pieces of code. All of the API, the, the API is very much geared towards fast operation, not towards uh, trivial usability, which is why you have always two variants of the API, namely a zero copy operation and a copying operator. The, uh, the zero copy variant is faster, but it's more complex to use. So tick your box. Uh, in terms of fast, these numbers at the bottom uh, I took from my Mac. Uh, over a large variety of message sizes, uh, that's about in an in a order of hundreds of nanoseconds, low non hundreds of nanoseconds per ring operation, and in the context of an overall real-time budget, it's completely negligible. In terms of what you can transport over these ring buffers, there are really three flavors of them. There's something which is very much like the Unix pipe. It's character-oriented, one-directional, no inherent structure in the data. It's really character by character. You would use that, for instance, if you talk to a maybe an I2C or SPI driver, which is essentially character oriented, where the stuff which goes out is not uh, not inherently structured. Yeah? Uh, so that's the stream stream ring buffer. Um, there are two more. The next the next one is pretty pretty simple. It's a record oriented. Uh, uh, interface, meaning you always give it a buffer and a length. And by the way, length zero is valid and it's preserved. Uh, that is important property in the context of using it with zero and queue. It's uh, it just preserves the, the record sizes end to end. Um, and on top of that, uh, that will why that it comes the third one, the so-called multi-frame ring buffer. That will only become clear once we have covered the basics on how zero and queue messages are structured. And it has to do with this end-to-end -end PC principle. We want, we, we want, to, want to retain the structures end-to-end. -end, and that's why, essentially, the zero and queue message structure is replicated here. So that we don't have to use these translators and transcoders and proxies. We don't want any of this. So we retain that, that, uh, uh, that structure. What that means, the so-called multi-framing, a message a multi-frame message consists of several records, all of them from zero to n, and a buffer of data, and they belong together. So the whole series of buffers uh, of frames is also delimited. Each frame in it is delimited, and the whole multi-part message is delimited. And that corresponds exactly to the zero Q messaging structure. You'll see in the translation boundary, this makes things very simple. It's, uh, it's not something you find typically in an operating source support, but it comes out of this end-to-end -end principle, which we want to retain all the way to real time from, from the web UI. 
it's actually not a very large library. It's a couple, couple of hundred lines of header code, but it's quite critical. And so it has seen quite a few eyeballs. So a ring buffer at that level is an anonymous structure in the sense it doesn't have a hell name. It's just a, a, a header which you include, and you give it a blob of memory, and you have two writing and two, two ends to it, a reader and a writer. Yeah? That could be, for instance, within a hell component. In that case, the ring buffer doesn't have a name. Yeah? It's just an Intel APR which you use. Uh, but once you transgress the, uh, the component boundary, it becomes more interesting to have um, these ring buffers as communication vehicles between components. Yeah? And that's why they've been elevated to hell objects, which you can operate uh, uh, and see in the hell command, actually just like pins and components. So they, they exist as named objects there. They have a size, they have a type, like stream, record, byte, and so forth. Uh, and you can create and delete them at the hell command level. Once components start, they can attach to those uh, and become a reader or a writer. That's the model. The, the a hell, a, a, a named ring buffer, uh, exists outside components. And it's actually owned by the hell library, not a particular component. It's typically created before you fire out the components which actually use it. You just tell the components, oh, by the way, this is the, this is the Pfeiffer over which you're going to talk to each other. Right? We'll see that in the, in the examples uh, shortly. Uh, it can be used in any combination. It can be actually used, and that's what I'm going to use in the demo, between two user threads, it can be used between our key components and any combination of the two. So it's a very, very versatile bridging vehicle. It's, it's fundamental, it's a boring structure, but it needs to be there. So <laughs> uh, a usage pattern which you find there, and it's reflected in the Python example in the next few pages, is um, either the ring buff exists, then you create, and then you attach to it. Uh, uh, if you're acting upon it, or it doesn't exist yet, then you create and then attach to it. So it's this create or attach operation. Uh, the API call is just, you give it a name and attach to it, and it fails if it's, it doesn't exist. If you redo it with a size, then it's, it's created. Yeah? Uh, there are uh, basic API functionality there. You can inspect the type, yeah, uh, what type it is, is there and the, the operations on the actual ring buffer? Surprise, surprise! Is there a record available? Read it. Uh, is there space available uh, to write a certain record and actually write it? So it's pretty much like a Unix pipe, yeah? except that it's real time capable. Yeah? Why? Why are you calling it a ring buffer instead of a queue? Uh, it's the name of the underlying data structure which we use. It can, uh, it, it is used as a queue. Yeah? Um, uh, I think it's because Pavel named it a ring buffer code. Yeah, it is a queue. Yeah, it's also a little bit more specific name for other algorithm uh, uh, For instance, a queue can be a list of linked objects. That's not what it is. Yeah, it implies a certain data structure. So it's a, a rather specific queue, if you will. You can hear a lot of inefficient queues. Like, like yeah. the, the, the ring buffer idea, like link lists are really great for other things, but if you want things you're going to talk to real time, um, then you want ring buffers. Yeah. yeah. It's a queue with a specific uh, data structure behind it. Certain limitations, for instance, it's fixed size. You cannot expand it. You could, you're going to know what you're, what you're going to use up, uh, and if it's, that's it, you're sorry. You don't, you don't lose, you don't lose all your data that starts on the right, you don't lose stuff. Yeah. Well, you see, you see, you look at the slide, the last column. Before you write, you want to check whether there's space available. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, do you use, uh, I think the question was, do you use data, uh, lose data, uh, if the ring buffer becomes full, full and write again onto it? Uh, yes, you do, but you don't do it that way. Before you write, you actually check if the write space is available. Actually, what the API does, it will fill the write for you. Yeah. 
it will let you know that it went or it didn't. So typical uh, case would be to wait a little bit and retry later. On the using side, the consumption is very easy. You check if a record is available, and that costs you like 70 to 100 nanoseconds. It's essentially just a pointer operation. Uh, so it's very cheap to do in a real-time component. And the nice thing about hell name ring buffers is they work completely invariant of which operating system and thread flavor you have. Whether that's a kernel thread system like Altai, whether it's Xenon, POSIX, or RT brand, it's all the same. It, uh, the alternative would have been to use some operating system support. And by the way, that was the idea. There was already a FIFO uh, uh, object at the HAL layer back from, when, uh, from John Casoli's talk many years back. And that was essentially a wrap up over the RTI FIFO, yeah? meaning it was just a glorified operating system specific FIFO. And by the way, with all that, it's semantics. And that's why it was inherently non portable. Yeah? So it, that's why we removed that and replaced it. That doesn't use any operating support, and it's why it works all the same through all the thread flavors. It's, uh, there's no difference at all here. Can there be a critical message and a full buffer? Uh, what, OK, that's a very good question. The question was, uh, what about message priorities, really? Uh, you have, say, there's a full buffer, and suddenly, or a, a pretty full buffer, and an important message is in queue. Uh, the answer to that is, uh, that is already the case, in, for instance, in a motion component, and when you're doing a board. Yeah? Let's, let's assume you're running a program, so the queue is full with all sorts of motion commands, and then you hit escape. That's exactly that use case. Uh, in the, uh, the way it's handled in the, in the current uh, motion component and the, the adapter API above it is that is special case. Thank you very much. <laughs> so it's specially treated. Uh, the obvious solution to that is you use two queues. Yeah? One's called the immediate queue, and one's the, say, motion commands queue. And the immediate queue is the one who is checked at each interval before the, the command queue. And if, if an abort message shows up there, we throw up the hands and bring the machine to a stop. Yeah? So uh, uh, with simple priority schemes, like high and low priority schemes, you can work around these by, uh, by skipping the question by using two queues. Oh, by the way, it's more robust because it's less code. And it's less potential to fail. Uh, <clears throat> I want to give you an example now of how you, how you use that at the Python level. That is, a, that is actually working uh, a hell of a ring, uh, a hell ring example. Uh, with a, uh, using the new Python bindings. If I um, just walk you down from the, from the top, assuming folks are somewhat familiar with, with the Python here, um, the first test, if the name is in this list, the, the, the set of hell rings, meaning it exists, that's the exist operator, does that, that named ring exist? In that case, we attach to it, that's the next line, uh, or, in the other case, it didn't, in which we, case we created with a certain size. That's the create or attach operation I referred to. Yeah. Uh, and the rest is pretty trivial. You'll see a, just a loop which tries to read from it. Uh, if it re re returns a non-object, meaning there's nothing there, you sleep a while. Otherwise, you print the, uh, uh, you show the output. And the last one is an interesting one, the shift operation. That's essentially the consume this record now operation. So we have a distinction between look at inspecting what we have and telling the ring buffer code, thank you very much, we're done now. Uh, make that space available. That's different from an operating system read, yeah? like, a, like a, in, a, in a Linux, uh, the Linux API that immediately consumes the message. We distinguish between looking at the message and consuming it. Uh, for those who try and uh, uh, know how ring buffers work, the shift uh, operations where the pointer advancing happens. 
Uh, the night, it's a little bit unusual, but easy to get used to. The big upside of this, it allows zero copy operations. It avoids a man copy of the, at, at the IPR level, so it's really a performance a twist. That is the read side of the example. We'll, we'll be able to run it uh, in, in a window. Uh, that is the right side. Uh, I'm, I'm using here user, user to user land. In a later example, we'll use a real time component at the other end. The incantation up to the uh, third, uh, two thirds down is practically identical. Attached to the name green buffer and write a couple of records to it. And uh, by the way, we get an exception there at the Python level if, if the, queue, the, the ring buffer was full at that point. So we can do uh, corrective action at that level. So it's, it's fully brought out to the, to the uh, uh, Python level. Now, those objects are already, they're also visible at the hell command level. Uh, there is a new command called show ring, and it will give you the name, the sizes, what type it is, the component IDs of readers and writers, how many uh, health components actually hold a reference to it or are looking at it, and a couple of flags which are way too detailed not to go into. It's no point here. Uh, so that's the inspection command. You show at the ring, show rings, or show, show ring and the name. And you can actually create rings at the hell command level, which is the second uh, bold command. And it's, uh, it, it, it appeared out of nowhere. So in the second command, the, the ring which we created is present. So that works very, very similar to like a signal, like, like you create a signal. Uh, it's a named object with a size. Uh, it doesn't do anything at that point, but it enables components to attach to it and work on them. Yeah? So the help, what I'm saying is help command uh, lets you inspect and create those if you want to. Typically, you would do that in a, in a, on a programmatic level. So, so ring buffers are a first class hell object at that level yeah? and, uh, and visible in hell command. I think that concludes pretty much of uh, the, the ring buffer part. Uh, I, I could actually. Uh, I'm going to do the demo separately. Okay, we're, oh, we're almost, we're 45 minutes to go. I'm going to really hurry up on this. <coughs> I'll try to conclude in so 20 minutes and uh, switch to Q&A and examples after that. I'm going to speed that up, otherwise I'll, I'm not going to make it. Uh, <coughs> what we're going to address now is Two more concepts, namely the we did just did the, the ring buffers and the name tile ring buffers on top of it. We'll need two more concepts. What's one is called the signal group, and the other one is the remote component. Those which have been following in the list for for those that might have heard about it, um, the signal groups I'm just mentioning here once now. It's not going to be used in examples downstream. Uh, what, it is, what signal groups are about is observing status of a running hell entity in a read-only fashion. Yeah? So and the way you do that is similar, like you look at it in hell command, you say show signal such and such, and you get, get the value. Now, in a remote scenario, you could do that as well, say, let me look at signal X, let me look at signal Y, and then uh, a couple of hundred else. Yeah? There are lots of them, which are typical. If you look at the EMC status structure, these are hundreds of fields. Okay? Now, if you go ahead and look at each of these signals in turn with, say, uh, with a message saying, give me the value of that pin, and now give me the value of that pin, and so forth, and then until you work through a couple of hundred of those, you can you see the response time on the watch. Yeah? That is just taking too long if you do that on a single object level. Because if you do messaging, the biggest overhead is getting a message going, 
once it's on a when when you decide to start a message, it really doesn't matter how much you tag onto it. Okay, so to get performance out of this is you need to coalesce as many objects as you possibly can into a single message. Then it's going to be real fast. And by the way, Hell Talk is not anywhere near a performance issue. It performs exceptionally well, but that's because of the large uh, measures of batching which we're using there. And signal groups is another of these batching mechanisms uh, on the performance side. And on the other side, uh, viewed, viewed from the status reporting perspective, it's one of the vehicles which you use to get rid of EMC status. It is, the, all what signal groups do is they allow you to coalesce a set of signals into a named group. That's all. You, it's, it's a set and it has a name and you can take on parameters. It is an object at the hell level these are actually hell command statements. Yeah? They're taken from an example file. You define a signal group with new group, the position, the, the group name, and maybe a parameter. And there are two possible parameters there. It's so much detail. And then you add existing signal names to that group. That's it. So the only thing what that really does is it defines that structure in the in hell shared memory, but that doesn't anything happened yet with it. Yeah? There's uh, the, the entity which actually takes care of those is again this hell talk process which adopts all the unserved groups and says, oh, okay, somebody's interested in that group, so let me start monitoring it, and if something changes in there, I'll let them know. Yeah? And that is what, what hell talk does. It's, it goes through all the groups and remote components, that's the next concept with which we touch upon, and it adopts all those which are currently not served. And it marks them as served. You are now being served by the hell talk process. And at that point, remote entities can view what is in these signal groups, which signals are there, what's their current value. Now, that is a very simple example. For instance, that's how you would structure a digital readout, readout which uh, would give you X, Y, Z. Yeah? Uh, you take the, the, the pertinent signals, uh, which fall out of, of the motion processing chain, you coalesce them in a group, and you have it served by Haltalk. So that concludes, that's all that is needed to have some other entity say, oh, by the way, I'm interested in signal group position, let me know, and suddenly there is a stream of updates coming for those. Yeah. So that's how these things fit together. We'll see the same trick uh, with a subscription in a health component service. And we'll expand on what that subscription means when we come to CRMQ. And it's becoming clearer. But that's a repeated pattern. We use HAL really as a management data structure. And there's nothing happening in there, but there are serving entities which pick out that data and then start operating on it. That's a very, very useful principle. So signal groups are read-only in nature. You don't write these signals. This is strictly a reporting thing. Okay? That's how you observe things. That's why I've taken the DRO, DRO example. Okay? You can, uh, this shows the HAL command API. There's a C API and the Python API just alike. It's, we've always had these three. Those are in place. Um, so I said, Signal groups are read-only. They are observatory, the status reporting vehicle. They are not for interacting with, with pins and signals. Okay? We need something else with that. And uh, that is the last one of the health concepts, which I'm expanding on. Uh, it's a little bit involved, but the, the, oh, it's done. But the, the, the idea is pretty simple. What, what really is a component? A component is a name, yeah, a component name. It has a set of pins, yeah, which might be in or out, or in out. Those pins have types. And it has what's called a thread function. Yeah? That is a piece of code 
which is periodically ex executed once the real time system is running. That's what you put onto a path, onto a thread with an add f statement in help command. That assembles the thread functions onto a thread. Okay? So it's these three things what defines a local component. It's the pin definition, a component name, and the thread function. Now, if we want to say run uh, a hell UI, like late BCP or uh, BCP remotely, yeah? if you look at those, late BCP is also a hell component. Yeah? Like, just like it, it's a user -like component, but it's just the same. Yeah? So it plays that hell game, if you will. But if we move that offshore to another processor over the network, well, that thread function starts making no sense because it's elsewhere, right? So we need to deal with that. The, the, the local component doesn't help us there. So what I came up with is this idea of a, re a remote component. It looks and smells the same, yeah? but it has no local thread function. Yeah? Uh, but it has pins. You can link to it. But it only gets into life one to is, once a serving process takes care of it. And by the way, again, that process is held off. The same thing which serves the single groups that serves the health, uh, remote components. Okay? So at the HAL level, the remote component is a stand-in, if you will, for a remote entity like a UI. I said like a UI. It could, by the way, be also another HAL instance, yeah? like a multi-spindle machine where HAL instances are synchronized over the over the table. This is the, the concept is not limited to UIs, although that's where we will be using it in a demo. Or completely outside machine control, it could be two control robot, two robotic entities talking to each other with two heroes. Yes. Or yes. a CNC and a uh, robot uh, to load it for a cell environment, whatever. Yes. Or control the garden spring. So, <laughs> uh, so what we're doing with this remote component is we're separating the current and collapse step, namely you, you, you start a component with hell in it in the name, you define all the pins, and then say, now it's ready, and by the way, the thread function is here. Now we separate this, that into two steps. We, we can define the component with all its pins, but we, we're not defining at that stage what code it is serving it. Right? So we separate the thread function from the component definition, because that's happening remote. In, and that only communicates over, over help us. That is, by the way, not a new problem. Okay? Anybody who dealt with uh, uh, Clay VCP and then embedded in Axis, uh, this decoupling would have come ha handy already in different situations. Like uh, I alluded to that already. Uh, the remote components, not surprisingly, have uh, support in the C API. For declaring them, so there's basically a new call how you, where you initialize a component of a certain type, namely, surprisingly, type remote. Um, and there are all, another set of calls which are only really used by HALTALK to serve these components. Uh, what these do is they automate pin change detection in the reporting sequence. Okay, so the stuff which it, which is happens manually, if you will, in the HAL user interface by iterating over the pins. That's all taken care of in the HAL API already. Um, you don't use that. You, uh, you just have HAL talk serving that to remote component be done with it. Uh, I'm just touching upon it once. You know that API exists. And if you happen to stumble over the header file, you know, OK, that's the, that's the library support which HAL talk uses to serve remote components. Um, now, let's have a look at how that is defined, looks in hell command. Uh, that is one which, we, which defines the component, which we'll show in the break in the demo over there, uh, with the beetle bone and the, the tablet interface. The tablet really, the application on the tablet really is the remote component. Okay? 
but it has a stand-in at the hell definition layer level, and that's where it's defined. Okay, so that's another set of hell command extensions. Uh, the new comp, new pin, and ready. Uh, not surprisingly, those directly correspond to C API calls, unlike hell init, uh, helping new and hell ready uh, C API calls. So. What that gives you is, once you've executed that, that component exists. You can link the help pins to it, uh, to, to signals, but they are not active yet. Okay. So that's just a de declaration layer, but you can link to them even if it's not active yet. I'll skip the epsilon part here. This has to, to do with change detection of float values. It's not important at this stage. Uh, right, so that's that's a bit of more of a high-level view of how, how these interact. Uh, we just saw the blue box to the right, that remote component, which lives in the HAL instance. And the whole talk process, the green box in the middle, grabs it. It adopts these dormant remote components and starts serving them. It doesn't do anything except uh, provide service to incoming users. It doesn't do anything outgoing at that point. But for instance, if you start a UI or several UIs, those would eventually connect to that health server and say, by the way, I'm interested in the motor control component. And at that point of time, point in time, the, the after verification, after verifying that. It all adds up. The types and directions of pins and so on match. Uh, what the hell the, the the client on the left sees is identical to what the the other hell components at the hell level see in terms of pin values. So that's where the mirroring starts in both directions. And uh, since we follow this one to n principle, we can have a uh, arbitrary number of, of clients on the left side, and they'll all synchronize to the same state. So there's this thing in, in, in Linux CNC where it could always run several UIs in parallel, and they would show the same. That's how it's handled at that level. Okay. So that's, again, the same trick like with signal groups. You have a declarative data structure in the HAL API, and you have a process serving it and exporting it to the rest of the world outside hell. That's how it's made remote capable. That pretty much concludes it. I'm just showing you on how you would uh, declare a remote component using the Python API. Uh, there's nothing so exciting in the first four lines. Uh, you create a component. By the way, it's type remote. Surprise, surprise. Uh, you add pins, and you added a component. The one thing which is new in this API is you have automatic support for change detection. You have a method on the, on the component that says uh, changed, and it retrieves you the list of all pins which have changed since the last time you looked at them. And that is the API call used for, chain, for, for status reporting, for, change, for pin change reporting, I'm sorry. And that's the, the Python flavor. Now, we've mentioned HAL talk a couple of times already. So that is really the remote server to, for the HAL layer. It is the, the, the remote tap into HAL, which is, as we said, a strictly local only affair. Uh, and it provides those two basic capabilities, reporting status and operating commands on scalars, on pins and signals. Nothing more. That's really what it does. Okay, so it has these two faces. It, it interfaces to the HAL C API on one side. On the other side, it has this URMQ protobuf and auto discovery face. And that's where remote UI components, uh, like the demo, will connect to. Think about a bit hurrying up. Uh, it it does a couple of things. It serves these remote components. By the way, any an arbitrary number. Uh, and it finds them at runtime. You can actually add a component while HealthLog is running, 
you type it in, in the help command, and the next time somebody connects to it, it will find the command. It just inspects what's currently there. Uh, configuration will move there as well as when eventually, but it's not important at this stage. So Hell Talk is the scalar face to the network of Hell, really. There's only a single instance needed. You'll be loaded as a user component. So, OK, that concludes the, the Hell engine room, if you will, in the supporting data structures. We now turn to the two missing parts. Then how do we get the messages from A to B? And what is in these messages? Okay? And I hope we'll finish before 11, before, before Alex tunes in. It might be we'll have to do a separate sam sample session later on. <laughs> um, OK, let me skip this. We we're now in our onion. You know, uh, network architectures are always described in onion models, like the OSI. That's why they make you weep. So, <laughs> so we're moving up a layer now and moving to the networking layer. <coughs> You've heard that before. We're using Serial Q for this. Um, I'll give you an absolutely minimal runtime what is in there. Uh, many of you might have programmed with sockets, TCP sockets at the, at the Unix level already. It, Serial Q reuses the term socket, although it has a slightly different meaning. So we'll talk a little bit about that. How messages are structured and what communication patterns we're using here. That's really all. And maybe a Python example. These, these four things. OK. Uh, about the principles, surprise, it uses URIs to identify a socket. OK? Um, ZeroMQ supports several transports. Uh, TCP is the one which we use when we go outside the box, if you will, over a cable. But it supports Unix domain sockets and very fast in the what's called the improv socket, which is, surprise, a ring buffer. Yeah? <laughs> okay. Uh, what's called a zero MQ socket can actually connect to several destinations in the same at the same time. Oh, that's a bit. <laughs> okay. It was a pleasure having, having you here. Nice to meet you, man. Nice to meet you. Have a good trip. <laughs> Applause for Jason Kredner. The man behind the people vote. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you have ever used Telnet or FTP or some other service and the other server wasn't running, you've noticed you get a connection refused if the destination is not running. So the server must run before the client. Yeah? That's been like this like 40 years or so. Like, yeah? Well, Actually, we're going to revisit that. Serial Q takes care of that. Uh, you're not forced to any specific startup order. The, the Serial Q library layer takes care of the fact that, for instance, the client started before the server, and they still find each other. So that's actually very convenient. And by the way, reconnections also happen automatically. You don't have to take care of that. So the rendezvous between Client and server is dramatically simplified. We don't. You don't have to take about take care about startup order. You don't have to take about reconnects and disconnects. Uh, it will automatically reconnect and send any missing resend any missing missing messages without loss loss or duplication. It's very handy. Uh, now, zero MQ sockets are typed in a sense. They are. They have. There's a whole array of socket types. They're called router, dealer, pub, sub, a pair, uh, xpub, xsub. Uh, we're not going to touch upon all the, the whole universe. We're only talking about two pairs, and that's the only ones which we're using in the whole entire you know? uh, And that's going to be in the next slide. But basically, if, when you create a CRMQ application, you decide on a communication pattern. We'll talk about that in the next slide, what these could be. And depending on a communication pattern, you choose the socket type. Okay? Uh, I'm, by the way, 
Serum QSOCs also have what's called an identity. That is an identifying string. And that is a origin designator. So if, for instance, you have the situation several clients are talking to a server, the server can tell who it came from. That's where the socket identity comes in. It's automatically prevented to a message sequence so the server knows where, where it came from. That sounds like super trivial. Well, NML didn't give you that. That's what we talked talk in about in the introduction. And that's one of the problems implementing a simple scheme like remote procedure calls in NML. You don't know where the damn call came from. So you can't return the values, which is super weird. Um, we'll have to talk a little bit about frame structure, what, how these messages are structured. Uh, as zero Q is concerned, those are just byte blocks. It doesn't interpret them. Uh, they are similar like the records, which we talked at the ring buffer level. They are always size buffer notation. It's not a stream like in, in, in a Unix pipe or a TCP socket. It's always buffer length. And by the way, zero length is always fine, and it's preserved. Yeah? So you see that principle. You see where the ring buffer API came from. <laughs> it's, it's a one-to-one -one copy of that abstraction. So there's a single frame, which is a blob of data with a size. And there's a second contraption called the multipart message which is, surprise, a sequence of several of those, OK? Uh, and that's treated as an entity. Yeah? Uh, it's called a single, single multipart message. In the actual use of a multipart message, we'll see that in an example, is uh, what these frames are used for. Well, the ones at the beginning are the originator ID, the identities who sent the message. Yeah? And the last one is typically the payload. And if the message transitions several in between hops, the, the list of identities might become longer. For us, it's always two-part messages, identity of the sender and the actual payload. And the identity of the sender gives the receiver the ability to route back the reply to the proper entity. Okay? Uh, and that's where, where the multi-frame ring buffer interface comes from. That's an exact clone of that concept. That's why we can carry these multipart messages all the way to our T component and back. OK. Uh, in terms of interaction patterns, which we use, there are three. Uh, the one is a simple one-directional message. Sometimes it's enough to send a message, because you get an acknowledgment in a different way not in a direct, direct reply. Uh, a very typical pattern is the request response pat pattern. Many call that a remote procedure call, right? or request reply sequence. Um, that is very common. Uh, a third one, which might not be as common, is what we call the publish subscribe pattern. Yeah? That is uh, a publisher with, which is essentially write only and subscribers, which are essentially read-only. Now, that one is new, and it's, it's a very useful concept. So the, the, the one above are really trivial. But the, the third one is super useful, but it's new. So what happens here is the following. A subscriber may connect to a publisher socket. They are tagged here x sub and x pub and that's the internal defines of the serial queue library. It connects there, and what it then does is express interest in certain topics. Yeah? That topic could be the Apple stock quote, AAPL, or it could be the name of a remote component, or a, the name of a signal group, or the name of task, or the interpreter, or I.O. control meaning that client is interested in status of these, these entities. Yeah? So a subscriber socket connects to a, a publisher and says, by the way, I'm interested in topics A, B, C, D, and E. Yeah? And 
if there is anything uh, noteworthy for the publisher to let the clients know, uh, well, that noteworthy is uh, associated with a certain topic. Yeah? For instance, pin updates for a remote component have the topic component name, yeah? the name of the component or the name of the signal group in case of signals. So what the publisher does is send a multi-part message which consists of first frame the topic, second frame the actual data. Okay? And the subscribers which subscribe to that topic get it. The ones which didn't, don't. Okay? So it's a very simple pattern. Yeah? You're you express interest by subscribing to a list of topics, and from then on, you get a stream of updates. Yeah? And that, that is not, not anything present, for instance, at the TCP uh, socket level, that, which is a much more lower level concept. Unfortunately, that slide, as I have here, uh, does not, um, sorry, it's, uh, it's due to the screen distortion. It's too short. But, um, the, the salient uh, arrow at the bottom means uh, whenever a client subscribes to a certain topic, the publisher gets a notification. Yeah? Oh, there was a declaration of interest. Okay? And that is used extensively in Hell Talk. For instance, somebody subscribes to the position signal group, and it means, oh, I've got to start serving it. So let me start change the text on it. Or Somebody subscribes to our remote component, motor control. Oh, we got to start serving that now. Yeah. So that is the, the way how changes are propagated to subscribers. Yeah. Um, let me just skip if that comes soon. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hope I finished it in time. Um, well, it's going to be close with. 50 minutes. Uh, these are all the communications patterns we use. They're really simple. One directional message, message with a reply, publish, subscribe. And every time a subscriber expresses interest in a topic, the publisher learns about it. That's really all of Serum Q what we are using. Yeah? Uh, and if you work through the manuals of those, there are tons of examples for other socket types and more complicated arrangements. That's the ones we need. Once you get the hang of those, you can read the code and follow what's going on. Uh, to give you an uh, idea how the Python binding to all this uh, looks is, and that's what actually what, for instance, Glade BCP uses. Uh, There's a serum Q Python extension. Uh, you need to essentially initialize the library. What's the, that's what the context line is about. Uh, then you create a socket of a certain type. You set the identity. We talked about the identity already. Uh, you connect it. Well, guess what? Here's the URI. And you send frames on it. That's all that is to it at the Python level. Okay? And now we look at it from the other side, namely the serving side. Uh, surprise, it also does the same thing, but it does a matching socket type, the router. Dealer and router are matching socket types. That is the server side, if you will. And it does a bind operation, meaning I'll, I'll wait for incoming connections. Uh, and it sits in a loop, and what is different here is it receives a multi-part message, uh, and if uh, what it if you print it out, you will find the first frame in that multi-part message is the identity of the, of the client. The second is whatever it sent. And what it does, it just flips around the message and sends it back. It's just for the sake of example. Yeah? But that pair, you can run that server with an arbitrary number of clients, and the responses all find their way back thanks to the identity frame handling. So, so Serum Q supports the routing of messages, actually through several instances of proxies, but we don't use any of that. So that's a request reply. Uh, 
We'll do the same thing for publish and subscribe. Uh, same incantation. We create a certain socket type. We connect to it. Uh, what that example does is, well, it takes topics from the command line, yeah, from the argument vector, and subscribes to all of those. Uh, if you subscribe to an empty string, that's a special case, meaning subscribe to all in uh, topics ever published. I want to know everything. Okay? And from then on, sorry for the short slide, but uh, late to correct, you receive a multipart message. That's the, the subscriber. Uh, sits there, the, receives a multipart message, and guess what? It gets two frames. The first one is the topic. The second one is the actual content, which the publisher sent. Okay, so that's that's the subscriber side, and uh, the the publisher side is a little bit more involved because it has the list. It has two sides. It must listen for the subscribe messages, and uh, it it periodically publishes a a message on a topic. Um, that's why it uses a, a, poll, a poll system called behind the scenes. Uh, but it's it's a very basic event loop. Um, if something's there, you decode whether it's a subscribe or unsubscribe event, meaning a subscriber appeared or disappeared. Uh, and so the, the, the one which is vanishing at the bottom of the screen, I'm sorry Can about scroll? that. Sorry? You can't scroll? Uh, can I scroll? Uh, yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe didn't change the frame, yeah. did uh, The publisher sends a multipart message, the first part being the topic, and the second part being the actual content. That's all what we're going to use from Zero and Q. That's it. Yeah. It's very minimal. Uh, to learn it all, it's sufficient to exercise the Python API. Like here, as you'll be pretty quick in getting the hang of it. And once yes or no? Yes. It's just in Node as well. There is a serum Q binding for Node. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Completely outside Linux, CNC, and machine talk, it's a very versatile tool. It's well invested time in exploring. Uh, <clears throat> so how are these patterns used? The publish subscribe, which we talked second about. Well, in the hell remote component, learning about pin changes. An arbitrary number of clients can connect to the components and by the way, let me know when the pin changes. Same thing with signal groups, signal changes in that case. An italic, meaning not yet done. Downstream, if an entity like the UI is interested in, in interpreter state change or task or all control, well, it does the same thing. Right? So the same pattern will be replicated at that level. That's a typical status observer thing. Uh, the last one is request reply. Well, surprise. Setting a pin value, setting a signal value. Eventually, starting a program run that will use that remote procedure call pattern. That's the tool we, we need. That's all of them. So you'll get through the basics in a few hours max with a with serum queue. Those are quite easy to get to get the hang of. What I've seen here is, uh, no, I'll skip that. That's not important at this stage. We need to get to the last part, uh, the protobuf encoding. On the left side, I'm just doing an introduction by example here. On the left side is, surprise, your, your, uh, your C structure definition. A uh, couple of fields, uh, and by the way, they are all mandatory, and they're fixed at compile time, right? On the right side, I've done a corresponding protobuf declaration of a similar message. The first three fields are identical in type. Uh, the other two, the, the ones involved below, are not. They are not included in the left side because you cannot express that at the C, C level. But you see that, for instance, the type field, it has the keyword required. It's got to be the, it's got to be in the message, and if it's not there, it's not a legitimate command message. Okay, 
So you have these three keywords, required, optional, and repeated. Optional is easy. It's there or it's not there. Uh, repeated means it's there anywhere from zero to n times for no strict upper bound of n. So it, it can be, it's a, technically it's an array with no, uh, no bound. Okay? It can be zero entries. Uh, it can be an arbitrary number of repeated segments. And the whole thing can be nested. You see, for instance, repeated segment. Segment is a message which is defined, defined, defined elsewhere. So uh, it looks and feels pretty much like a C uh, structure, uh, except for these three things, the required, optional, and repeated. The basic data types are all the same, int, uh, boolean, double, that's your standard scalar type universe, plus the support for strings and blobs which are very handy, handy at the user interface level. So that's just by way of comp comparing the two, two methods. Um, how you declare a message in C, and what the problems are with it, and how you do that in protocol. OK, now, the last thing is I've got to run this in Cranby 3 in three minutes, or we'll be late. Um, just a look on what protobuf is. You just saw the first protobuf message declaration. That's called a proto file. That defines on what possible fields are in a message. A yeah? message has a name. We use the name command there. It's the message type, if you will. It supports scalar strings and nested messages, optional repeated, and required. So. <laughs> So that's the that's the, the, the declaration language. Uh, once you use it, yeah, you set up such a, a message in C or Python or one of the forty plus bindings uh, protobuf has. Uh, it's what it, before you transmit it. There's a step called serialization, meaning the message which you declared at the programming language level is coded into wire format, okay? And that's how it gets into a 0MQ frame. It's encoded as into wire format, and then it's sent off through a 0MQ uh, socket, okay? At the other side, the receiving end, you have the inverse step, uh, namely deserialization, parse, parse the, the received frame into a protobuf message again, which is a C class, really. That's derived from the proto file. Uh, so these two steps, the serialization and deserialization, those are automatically covered. You just write the proto, the message definition in the proto file, and then magic happens. That's all compiled behind the scenes for you, for any language you request. Okay? The result is linked to the internet application. That's fine, but uh, we're not using any of that. The, the last example I'm drawing your attention to is the, 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 bot, the last line. We talked about wireline. That's how it gets out on the wire, surprise. But there are other con conver conversions which are included. One being extremely pr uh, practical for debugging. It's called the text format representation. It very much looks like the proto declaration. So if you inspect the proto path message, you just print it to text format. There's no more need to print as fields or something. It has a standard external representation called text format. So you can always write it into text format. And by the way, you can get do it in the other direction as well from text format. So you can always save a message stream, stream to a file and resend it. It's all taken care of. It's bidirectional. These arcs mean in all of the directions. And the third one is, well, surprise, JSON. Yeah? You serialize the JSON format or deserialize from it. I'm um, ramming down through the last example. Well, so what happens in the, in the uh, sorry, that's a little bit small font. Uh, but it is touchy because uh, Roger already tripped over it. What happens in the, during the build process with these proto files? Um, sorry about the small font. The first line really means how the Python bindings are done. Once you have the proto definition, 
a program called the Protobuf compiler is run onto it. And it's told with an argument, by the way, please create the Python binding. And a result is if the, the base name of the, of the proto file was foo, that creates a binding file called foo underscore pb2.py uh, that is ready for inclusion in the program in a, in a Python, as a Python module. So those are automatic. For, for Python, it's rather straightforward. For C, that's the three we use. For C++, it creates a header and a, and a C++ code fragment. Uh, all of those are collapsed into a library, which you need to link into any applications using the C++ version of the bindings. And once we're getting to real time, we're using a third form, which is a C binding. And that one is real time compatible. It doesn't do any malloc. It doesn't require C++ or anything. It's called nano PB. It was originally done for embedded, which, which has very similar requirements like real time. And uh, that is, again, collapsed into a library for user land, but also into a real time module to support the RT land, which is really a different symbol space. So that happens between the videos behind, behind the scenes. If you do a build operation, uh, it creates the Python modules, the C++ libraries, the head and C++ headers, and the, the libraries for, for real time, both for, for the real time and the, and the user land side are connected to it. That happens behind the scenes. Uh, I'm, I'm simply running out of time, so. Uh, I'm just giving you an example on how you would use that at the Python level. Again, that's probably too small. Um, guess what? I, I missed the most important import, which is a demo underscore pv2.py. It got cut away. I'm sorry about that. Um, the bold. Uh, the line with the bold keyword means create a new message of that type. And from there on, you fill in fields as required. And that's what it, uh, uh, that's, that's what fills in the fields. When you're done, you can serialize it to a string, uh, meaning with the wire format, um, to, uh, to JSON or to a text format. And there's an inverse process for, for parsing it. I'm sorry I'm running out of time on this. Uh, so I think I'll have to skip. But this is a, a simple demo here of, of that very program which I showed here. That is the wireline format. Well, it's just hex blobs. The whole frame, the serialized frame is 177 bytes long. Uh, if you dump it as text, that is the standard text representation, which is part of the library support that comes with the Google library. And uh, any message can be transformed or parsed, transformed to or parsed from that format. You can always store or read a message from a text file. And the third one is, well, you just tell it to convert to, sorry, again, doesn't fit on screen, transfer transform the same message to JSON format, and it automatically comes out as JSON, but we didn't have to do any manual manipulation to achieve that. Okay. Uh, that is the last, I've got to run through this because I'm running into, into Alex's time already. Um, WebTalk is the, the last, is the matching server to HellTalk, as far, but the only major difference is it talks to HTTP and web sockets on the using side. On the back side, it connects to the rest of the CRMQ universe. So, for instance, if you would do a Hell application in JavaScript, yeah, uh, that JavaScript code would connect to the WebTalk server with a certain URI saying, uh, I'm interested in remote components, such and such. I want to talk this protocol, and the WebSocket, the WebTalk would connect internally 
to hell talk to achieve that. But at the boundary, it does the translation to JSON and to web sockets. It's no semantic change, it's really just a format change. Uh, and that's what, how you can hook from the from a HTTP, uh, from a web UI into the whole thing. It's a simple proxy which does the translation at the edge. Eventually, we might use something else, like an like embedded Node.js or something. Uh, but that is a portable solution, and it does depend on Node.js, which I wanted to avoid. It's a just-in-time compiler, which isn't portable. Uh, I gotta skip through those. Okay, I'm wrapping up. Uh, where we are is making hell remote comp comp uh, capable is pretty much functional and complete. Some minor works remaining. Uh, what uh, we need to do is how authentication and credentials work out. It's too easy to connect to these things now remotely and wiggle buttons. Okay, that's a bit touchy. So. Uh, we also want separation of credentials, for instance, into read-only UIs and those which are actually change-capable. So that has to be something which happens at the socket level, and both authentication and, and credentials as far as HAL operations go. The config service and the message bus parts, uh, message bus parts needs finishing, but that's not relevant for HAL operation. All that means is Currently, we continue to use any files until I'm done. Yeah. Um, for remote hell UIs, it's perfectly fine to use already. I don't envisage any changes in the protocol, and there's also been no changes in the protobuf message types since month. So it's rather stable, actually. Yeah. Uh, and that, uh, I I'm not sure if Alex actually changed the protobuf file during the creation of quick 3 cp Maybe just a minor thing, but nothing extensive. Um, so that's all in place. Uh, now on the UI side, we have two which have been converted to that. That's Glade VCP. Glade VCP is a hell application with user run only locally. It all you can run it now remotely on a different machine. And connect through Helltop to this uh, uh, remote component. And QT Quick VCP, on which the next talk is going to be about. I want to break off the build integration is done. It's present in my repo in github.com mhubler. Uh, it's the top branch for my machine talk preview too. Uh, if you want to look at the tutorial examples, you would go, want to go to source machine talk uh, tutorial, surprise. Okay? So it's relatively easy to find. And it gives you the ex executable examples of what I, what I talked to you, and for which time was a little bit too short of me being too nervous. So thanks for listening to the firehouse. <laughs> uh, and I hope I didn't confuse you all too much. Yeah. After Alex's presentation? Uh, probably. Let's see who's there. Anybody? Uh, yeah. Is anybody even monitoring the, the message queue? Uh, that's what we're trying to I figure know out. That you're looking for. I just wonder if anybody can do it. Oh, there. Okay, yeah, so there's a list, and uh, we can tell people uh, we're going to get back to you. Looks like uh, no questions. Yeah, some of that is, is old news about uh, I confused uh, so. Thoroughly. Right. <laughs> no, well, no, 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 no. We're going to go ahead and stop the broadcast and switch over to Alex's presentation. Okay. Let's do a little list, a couple of minutes break, because it's going to be yes. too much. <laughs>